Hi, this is Robert McLaughlin. I'm the cinematographer on Game of Thrones, Ray Donovan, and Westworld, and you've been listening to the Go Creative Show. Hey, everyone. My name is Ben Consoli. I am a director and owner of BC Media Productions, and this is the Go Creative Show, the show dedicated to creative professionals in the video production, filmmaking, television, and music industries. Robert McLaughlin is the brilliant cinematographer behind the lens of some of the most iconic Game of Thrones episodes, and he's here today to share behind-the-scenes secrets. The Go Creative Show is supported by our friends at Kessler, making innovative tools for filmmakers. Visit them at KesslerCrane.com. Rule Boston Camera, buy, rent, create at rule.com. Newshooter.com, essential news for real-world shooters. Hedge from Act, the fastest way to back up media. And PremiumBeat.com, premium, royalty-free music and sound. Well, you've asked for it, and now you have it. Game of Thrones finally being covered on Go Creative Show. We didn't avoid it. No, 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 no. We're just waiting for the right time, and now certainly is the right time, especially with the uh, loot train battle, which everyone was going bananas over a couple weeks ago. Uh, that was shot, that whole episode was shot by Robert McLaughlin, as well as so many others. Um, Red Wedding, uh, all the iconic scenes that you guys know and love. Uh, most of them, a lot of them, were shot by Robert McLaughlin, and we talk about it uh, in just a few minutes, so it's going to be a good one. It's going to be a good one. But before we get there, I want to talk about Rule Boston Camera. Rule is the place to go to purchase and rent all of your production equipment. Uh, but they also are highly dedicated to teaching our production community. Even when you go to their site, they have three very easy buttons right there, buy, rent, and learn. That's how dedicated these guys are. They put learn right there on the front page, and that's why we love them. Now, you go to that page, and there's all sorts of events that they have coming up. And we talked about them and talk about them uh, on episodes of Go Creative Show all the time. But I want to draw your attention to something different. This is called uh, – it's a series they've created called In the Showroom. And this is awesome. Uh, they're showroom demos of all these products that you want to know about. And they're short little, very easy-to-watch videos. And they have a whole bunch of them on their Vimeo page. Here's just a few to, to uh, get you guys excited about it. Uh, benefits of the Teradek Bolt Pro wireless video transmission system. I love the Teradek Bolt Pro, and they teach you all about it here. Uh, the Flow Cine Black Arm 3-axis dampening system. That is certainly something you guys should know about. Um, Arri LED sky panels. A whole video on that. Uh, it, it, and it goes on and on and on. They've got so many great videos, and they're, they're informative, they're quick, uh, really well produced, and a great opportunity to learn about all these products for free. So you can learn about it, you can rent it, you can buy it. They offer everything at Rule Boston Camera. So it's easy to get there. You just go to rule.com, R U L E.com. And I'll put, uh, of course, I'll put a link to this series in our show notes. And you should go there too at gocreativeshow.com. But really, just go to rule.com and it's all there for you. R U L E.com. And lastly, Hedge for Mac. Hedge for Mac is the fastest application for backing up media in OS X. I use Hedge for Mac pretty much daily. I started mostly just on set uh, because I had the Hedge for, Mac, uh, Head for, Hedge for Mac app on my computer and I'd be doing backups on set. So I'd get heart, I'd get, um, you know, media cards from my camera operators and audio people. I'd import it into the computer. I'd send it out to multiple hard drives. So you can import from multiple sources, send it to multiple destinations all at the same time. Um, and it was really perfect for on-set backups. I have now started using it more and more in my studio, making daily backups of my hard drive. So I'm finding more and more uses for it as the time goes on. And I love this app. It's so fast. Uh, it, it, and it gives you the peace of mind to know that everything's being backed up accurately. And it's also fast. And if you get the Hedge Connect app for iOS, you'll get a notification on your phone when your transfer is done. So it can't be any easier than it is. And that's why we love it. You get a 20% off discount by going to hedgeformac.com forward slash go creative show. Uh, and the full price is $100. So that's, that's a great uh, discount there. And that's really what you want. Yes, you can get a free version, but just get the, get the full version because you get a 20% off discount. And if you're listening to the go creative show, you guys are professionals and you're going to be using, you're going to be using it. So just get it. You'll love it. Please. People have been telling me they've been buying it and from hearing about it on the show. And I've only heard great reviews and I use it all the time too. So I strongly suggest you check it out. Hedge for Mac, H E D G E F O R M A C.com forward slash go creative show. You will love 
this app for sure. All right, it's time for our spotlight. Robert McLaughlin, cinematographer Robert McLaughlin, is the director of photography for Ray Donovan, Westworld, and some of the most iconic episodes of Game of Thrones. Robert and I dive deep into the cinematography of Game of Thrones, discussing the -the behind-the-scenes secrets from the epic loot train battle, the classic red wedding scene, and many more of your favorite and most memorable Game of Thrones moments. So I'm here with Robert McLaughlin, cinematographer of basically every show that you're obsessed with right now. (laughs) We've got (laughs) Westworld, Ray Donovan, and of course... Game of Thrones. Now, Game of Thrones, uh, they do things differently. They don't have the same cinematographer for the entire season. But I'm sure you'll find in talking with Robert here that all of the iconic episodes that you know and love were really him behind the lens, which is exciting. I'm going to talk all about it. Robert, thank you so much for being on Go Creative Show. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. And and I should say, you know, I, I don't know if all the iconic show uh, episodes... Um, were mine, but I am very proud of the ones that I did do, and and um, they they certainly seem to uh, um, engender pretty strong audience and fan responses, and rightfully so. I mean, the I was telling you early on um, that I'm not a huge mega Game of Thrones fan, and I know that that's probably going to drive some of the listeners crazy here. But I, so I'm not going to be coming to it from kind of a fanboy perspective, which might be refreshing for you. Uh, Absolutely. I, I, I want to come to it from just a cinematography direction. And there's, there's a great article that I'll put a link to in the show, note that, uh, show notes that you did with GQ that sort of broke down uh, some of these iconic scenes and what your approach was. And I, I kind of almost want to start there because there's some really great stuff there. And, um, you know, I, let's start with that loot train battle. I mean, there's no need to bury the lead. This is the episode that everyone was waiting for. This is the episode that everyone was talking about. It was epic. It was huge, and I'd love to uh, talk to you about it. Yeah, I think I think the great thing about that episode, first of all, was that nobody was. Ex- I don't think anybody was expecting something quite so epic from a mid-season episode. Yeah. Um, and if if it had had the original, the the director who was originally scheduled to do the show, David Nutter, done Dance of Dragons and the Red Wedding and and the, and um, the Walk of Shame episode. Um, you know, any serious fan would know that he's one of the show's favorite directors and is generally given um, the the tougher, more important ones. Um, but the thing, they, they wouldn't have had that clue this year because David unfortunately had to withdraw at the last minute to have back surgery. Oof. And they brought in a first-time Game of Thrones director, Matt Shackman, to do the show, um, who's main claim to fame before that was was a lot of episodes of it's always sunny in philadelphia which was sort of i think as far as the director is concerned casting against type wow Um, but obviously the uh i mean matt matt's one of the smartest guys i've ever worked with and and worked very hard um and making sure that his game of thrones debut was a good one and and the proof is in the pudding i think i think it was a i think it was a great surprise for the fans to have a have a you know what would normally be a a season climax episode you know in the middle of the season and you know the other big action one that everybody was expecting would have been the um, North of the Wall episode that it just aired last night and I hadn't seen that I'm I was frankly um, a little <laughs> um, I I shouldn't say this but i was pleasantly uh surprised that it didn't outdo the loot train attack <laughs> by a long shot <laughs> do you feel like do you get a little competitive with just knowing that you're not you're not responsible for shooting the entire series i think people do them in twos right do you, are you guys working on the okay. yeah in, in, in a normal season um there you know a normal season of five or, or of 10 episodes there are five directors with five cinematographers and five assistant directors and th- those little teams of three or four if, if you throw another uh, AD and um, hop between the two sh- filming units. But the thing, the interesting thing is that you're, that all five teams are there at the same time. So at least during the prep period before some, a couple of them are going to always be out shooting. Um, all five cinematographers are sitting in the same office in Belfast. Um, having been, you know, maybe having just 
landed from their various locations, scouts in Spain or Croatia or Iceland or wherever it happens to be. And we're all basically scratching our heads, wondering how the hell we are going to accomplish what each of us has been handed to do. Um, <laughs> but, you know, eventually, with enough attention, you know, the, the answers become become uh, obvious and and you get down to it but but just getting back to your question about you know the sense of competition um there's a lot of cooperation you know a massive amount of cooperation between the dps and there's also a very strong commitment for none of us to be um you know reinventing the wheel on a particular set or what have you and and the show's post-production people are very good with supplying us with lots of visual reference from previous seasons so that we can all look at both, you know, what not just ourselves have done, um, if we've been there before, but also other DPs have done on sets that the producers deemed sort of the most successful examples of how to treat a particular set or location so that we can keep some consistency to it. Having said that, everybody always wants to do the best possible job they can. And I think if there's any, if there's, uh, if there's any jealousy between the various teams, it's usually over who gets handed what scripts. And yeah. and I, I know, for instance, on season four, I was working with this fabulous director, Michelle McLaren, who's best known for, for Breaking Bad episodes. Um, she was, I, I mean, it wasn't a big deal to me one way or the other, but she she was really unhappy that her episodes didn't have any dragons in them. And of course, there, there really wasn't, there weren't too many scenes with dragons prior to season six and now this season of course they're they're uh, you know um uh, abs- uh, you know ubiquitous to uh, to all the episodes um but so really um there's the, the directors tend to envy the guys who get the big action set pieces often or sometimes they envy the ones who get the simpler scenes like <laughs> like episode five that was that was much more you know just a bunch of really great character driven scenes with a couple of you know actors in a in a in an amazing location now so you get this script you are working with a First time director. I mean, they're not a first time director, but it's a first time director for somebody at, at this level. Uh, did, did did you start? You know, did you start thinking to yourself like, how are we possibly going to do this? Were you nervous at all going into this? No, not this season, um, because I know. I mean, the the support that you have to make a show there is so amazing on that show. It's it's. I mean, it's a big reason why the show is so successful. The producer Bernadette Caulfield is amazing. Chris Newman. Who, who's her right hand guy is amazing hmm. um and you know they 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 off, they actually go out and select a lot of the locations before we get there but also the visual effects department is second to none um and at this point now by season seven you've got a crew that have been incredibly loyal and keep going back it, i haven't seen any of the kind of attrition that you normally would on a big series where there's a lot of turnover of crew um and and it's all the more amazing because it's absolutely one of the toughest shows going. And it also requires even the British crew to be away from home because they're based in Belfast. Um, a lot of the crew are local to Belfast, but, you know, certainly the heads of all the departments and a lot of the technical expertise is coming from um, London, if not, and, and various parts of Europe and North America. Um, you know, there have been a lot of Canadian DPs and directors on the show um, um, as well as American, and it's when you're away from home for so long on something that's so damn hard. It's really remarkable that they keep the crew coming back, and the way they do that is by taking very good care of them. There's a huge amount of loyalty and commitment on the part of the crew, and so you know when you're returning to a season seven and you've got a bunch of people who not only aren't new but are you know have been doing it day in and day out almost for seven seasons. That really makes a big difference. I want to talk about some of those challenges that you're referencing about just how hard this was. Uh, looking back on that scene, what was the biggest challenge that you had to overcome? For a cinematographer on a sequence like that where you're spending days and days, in this case, I think, I think we were 18 days on just the, the, the battle from the time that scene starts to the last shot in the episode. Hmm. Um, we had a couple of other shooting days on that location that included the opening scene of the episode with the loot train um, making its way across the prairie. Um, so, you know, you're looking at basically 
oh, but the best part of a month um, to shoot a scene that takes place over what I think I, I don't think that scene ran more than twelve or so minutes, yeah, twelve or yeah. fifteen minutes at the most. And when you're dealing with it, uh, the inconsistencies of weather on shots that are going to be sandwiched right up against each other, that is a DP's biggest nightmare because you need the con- you need to have it appear consistent. And if you're doing something that's much smaller and more intimate, um, just you know, like a dialogue scene, two people riding a horse somewhere, um, something much more contained like that, even if it were over multiple days. Um, the shots are not of such a big scope that you can't get your big heavy cranes in with your big silks so that you can mitigate the sun if it's coming in at a nasty angle yeah. or bring your lights in to make it look sunny if, it, if, if you have lost the sun. On a, something of, of that magnitude and scope, there's no way that you can do that um, uh, except on maybe some of the close-ups. So I, I knew going in that that was going to be our biggest struggle. And to a certain point, you know, you can, you can control things photographically with how you treat the contrast between a sunny and a, and a not sunny day. But the big, um, my, 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 my big uh, ace in the hole was the fact that once the dragon has struck the loot train, there was an excuse to have a vast amount of smoke. Mm. And I had in the past on various shows used smoke to blot the sun out when, when you know, the scene, the, the mood and tone of the scene and, 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 and subject matter were such that you really didn't want a nice, pretty, sunny day. And um, my uh, I, Matt Shackman, the director, and I both sort of came in with the same visual references, one of them being the... Uh, the um, napalm attack and helicopter attack from Apocalypse Now, you know, mm. the death from above idea was very much in the back of our minds. And and also the great thing about working with Matt was that he's he's not only very trained in theater, but also in fine art. And most of my references visually... I tend to lean much more on, on on fine art than on you know other movies that have come out and so on and so forth in terms of the light and the mood and the tone because you know they it's it's all been done before between between you know Leonardo da Vinci and right up to John Singer Sargent and and uh, Winslow Homer and and everybody in between the Dutch masters and you know Georges de la Tour Caravaggio all of them um, are a good starting point and the painting that. I, that that sort of I respond to because it's in a palette that I really like, which is very tends to be very warm. Was J M W Turner, where and 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 what I was aiming for, and what we I think we we achieved partly practically, but also with the help of the visual effects department, was a sense that you know the whole scene was was lit by sun, but heavily filtered by by smoke and the occasional cloud that would go over. So what having all that smoke did was that it, it, it made it possible to set, have, in fact, have a couple of shots cut together. One might have been in sun, one might have been in heavily filtered sun, but they wouldn't throw the viewer out of the story by, you know, dramatically um, visually bumping the way it would, you know, in an extreme example where, and we've all seen it in movies and, and TV shows, it, because it's, it's, it's sometimes unavoidable, where... Uh, several of the shot, you know, you'll you'll ha- you'll have shots in in bright backlight sunlight. The next shot, it's the sun's from directly above because it was shot a week later at noon instead of at four in the afternoon. Yeah. And another one, you can almost sense rain or what have you, and it's and it's cold and overcast. And even the best digital technology makes it very hard to have that stuff not bump. So that in a it's, that's that, that that's the long version of of what my biggest challenge was. In terms of all the other little elements that you have in a scene like that and the ones that sort of, you know, my, my initial reaction to reading the scene was just this this sinking feeling knowing that it was going to be a, a long, slow, laborious process because you have so many massive elements that have to be brought together for each shot. There's like nothing was simple. Um, you know, whether it's mustering 400 extras and getting them all made up at the right stage of makeup, depending on what point the battle was in to, um, dealing with horses and safety issues and fire and all that stuff. Um, I've done enough big action set pieces between television and, and, and the features that I've worked on that I knew that was going to be, um, just, it, it, it it's, it's just really, really laborious and, and, 
as a cinematographer, you have to really rely on uh, uh, a lot of patience to because you're waiting for everybody else to you know get all their elements ready for your camera, even if the camera's been ready for for a while. So it's it's a different style of filmmaking, and 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 quite frankly, not my favorite. I mean, uh, as a cinematographer, I'd rather walk into a a dark stage and treat that like a blank canvas that I can then start turning lights on and molding and sculpting the light and, 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 you know, finding a, a simple camera move to film a, uh, 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 as elegantly as possible, you know, a scene, hopefully not, And And one of my favorites was last week's episode between Tyrion and, and Jamie, where they're in the, uh, in the, in the catacombs of the red keep. And it was an amazing location in Spain that they gave us, which had formerly been, several hundred years ago, the shipyards in which the Spanish Armada was built in Seville, Spain. And, and wow. we blacked the whole thing out and, and lit it very simply. It's a simple scene and it's an awesome scene because the writing's good, the acting's good. And it's kind of for a cinematographer. Um, it, it's interesting to hear you talk. As you're describing the loot train battle, I can almost like hear in your voice that you're still overwhelmed by it, <laughs> even, even though it was so long, even though it's already been done, it's been a success. But you, you can hear in your voice just going back to that time of like the weight of that scene on you must have been incredible. And what, you know, I'm watching it and I'm thinking, I, I just do 30 second ads for the most part. I, I'm mostly a commercial director, but like I'm even thinking just. You know, th th having to wait for all of the flames to be in continuity and just making sure that all the burns are the same across 18 days. And it just it's an overwhelming thing to even think about. Um, it, it, it's massive, you know, and when, obviously, you know, going into that, there's a massive amount of planning. And one of the good things about that show is that all your prep time is not front loaded. It's sort of spread through the schedule because the, one of the luxuries of having, you know, all the directors and all the DP shooting, sharing the two crews all the time is that you're not actually shooting every single day. So you do have some down days to a fair few non-shooting days when you can really focus on this stuff increasingly as you get closer to the day. And, 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 and with any sequence like that, the only way to get through it is to, is, you know, it's one shot at a time and you have to know exactly what those are well in advance. And, and obviously in a sequence like that, where visual effects play such an important element, and visual effects are so expensive, um, especially you know you know they, they they there were very few shots that weren't touched by visual effects, however yeah. in however small a way after the dragon strikes, and um, so really a lot of the creative process went on weeks and months in advance when that scene was being uh, previsited so that it could be budgeted accurately and we knew what we were getting into and the order that we were going to do it. And really that's the only way to, to tackle something like that is, you know, it's, it's, um, you, you just, you just, you've got this huge block of marble in front of you and you just have to whittle it down one tiny chip at a time. I want to talk about the camera motion. Um, we have a perspective of, uh, from the dragon from up high, um, we also have tons of moving cameras uh, following the horses and the, and the battle scenes. Can you talk to us a little bit about your strategy for the motion cameras? Yeah, you know, the, um, the, I, I tend to, uh, the longer I do this, the more um, I tend to delegate. We, you know, we, we collectively got together. We, w once we made sure everybody understood what the nature of each of those shots were, um, then they weighed in on, you know, what, the best vehicle or the best conveyance was going to be. And, you know, we, we really didn't want to use cable cam if we could help it. But at the end of the day, it was the only way to do repeatable moves. For instance, in order to fill the battlefield up with, with have it look like there are 5,000 horsemen riding down a hill and you only have 50, which, which doesn't sound like a lot, but 50 guys on horses is, is, is a great deal, but it's certainly not enough to fill up an, ex, uh, an expansive area. Um, yeah you have to do it with multiple, multiple passes with a perfectly repeatable um, camera. And the only way to do that was, was off of cable cam. And we had several passes that we had to do that from. So, and it took a long time to move the cranes around. So we scheduled other work in between moving this very heavy equipment around and resetting it for, for other versions. Usually we tried to have them do that overnight. So I think in the end we had three different uh, vehicles that we used 
for traversing the terrain and it really came down to what terrain we were we were on how fast we had to go and so forth and then we fitted one of several um uh, uh stabilized motion or stabilized heads to those those uh vehicles and that cable cam was our overhead dragon perspective shot that's what we're talking that, about that's right and um you know in, in some versions that didn't need multiple passes. We technically could have used a, a um, some kind of a, a remote helicam of some sort on, um, but HBO has very strict rules about using them anywhere near people, and we couldn't do that. We did use it for a, sh- a nice long shot down over the lake as she approaches the battle, but um, that was really about it. And the rest we had to do off the cable cams and uh, and and more conventional camera conveyances but at, at the end of the day we used about just about at some point just about every every type that there is but each one was very much tailored to a specific use in a specific shot and um you know you think that there'd be an unlimited budget for having all this stuff just sitting there for when you when you when you want it but in fact we only had certain items for certain days and they would come and go and we'd have to make sure that we stayed on schedule and stayed to our our, our very tight timetable so that you know, the day that a particular tracking vehicle was available or the days that it was available, we were using it for what we needed it for. And quite frankly, there were a few times when, you know, it would have been nice to have had more stuff there, but, um, you know, the budget is is absolutely not unlimited and you have to schedule all that stuff very carefully. I want to talk about an idea called interactive lighting that I read about in one of the articles that you've done about this episode. Um, what does that mean, and how were you using that in these dragon attacks? Well, obviously, um, when a huge fireball is going off or uh, something in in proximity to characters or objects, um, you would reasonably expect to see an effect of that light on them. But because the fire was all being added, or, or a great deal of the fire was being added after the fact, other than the obvious pyrotechnics um, that we added on the ground, um, we had to create the effect of that light on surrounding objects. For instance, if some of the soldiers were being set alight, the ones adjacent to them, you would expect to see some effect of that light on them. But the problem is our lights, our movie lights, aren't close to bright enough to to overcome the, uh, the natural daylight. So yeah. that was just another sort of level of difficulty that got added because it meant that all those shots where we were adding interactive light, which I think I was using um, big old conventional um, brutes on dimmers, um, had to be done either very early in the day or very late in the day when the light was starting to fall. And in fact, all of our fire sequences, we tried as much as possible to do late in the day when we weren't competing with hard sunlight. So it was just one of the other dozens and dozens of little scheduling elements that the assistant director had to factor into his time frame. And also, um, you know, the special effects people had to sort of time their uh, placement and and readiness according to that schedule as well. Mm. I want to bring up another scene here that's really the complete opposite. I mean, you think of the Loot Train battle as a gigantic, huge, epic battle scene. Um, But I want to talk about Shireen's death from Dance of Dragons, because this is a very, compared to uh, Loot Train battle, it's incredibly small, but it's driven by emotion more than anything else. And it is just as cut-wrenching, it's just as heart-pounding. And uh, a completely different type of scene, and I'd love to get an in, uh, to get some insight as to how you approach that scene. Um, you may want to just do a quick recap to bring people up to speed of where that is. Uh, but, sure, but it, but it is it, it was certainly one of the most uh, impactful scenes that people have talked about. And uh, watching it back before this interview, it truly is something uh, to discuss, and I, I'd love to hear about it. Yeah, Shireen's death was a was a big one. I mean, when when we 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 read it, we were. We, it, Quite frankly, you know, it was it was like one of those scenes that you would have rather somebody else's episode had in it because <laughs> the you know the, the 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 pressure to get those things right is enormous and and um it had to be it was obviously going to be heart heart wrenching that little girl w- was was adorable both on screen and off and um, our our first goal our primary goal was to do it as tastefully as possible and and 
but you know, I, you know, it also had to be profoundly disturbing. And yeah. one of the things I did that we we tend not to do on that show, or at least at that point on season five. Um, it was kind of verboten was to close the shutter on the camera to get what, you know, people associate with the action scenes, for instance, in Saving Private Ryan, mm-hmm. um, to use a, a really obvious example. Um, and that only later in that season, they started to use a bit because it helped make the uh, whites look a lot more disturbing and a little less goofy. Um, but it's also something that I've kind of kept in my back pocket for years when when I'm filming particularly bad guy or something disturbing is happening even if there's no overt action in the scene i'll go to a 90 degree shutter on the camera um or even a 45 degree shutter which which removes all the motion blur and if you're just shooting a a simple close-up in this case the red witch speaking making her speech or simple little actions like the little girl being strapped to the post, it gives it a very, very subtle and violent, edgy feel to it. There's something very off-putting about it. And yeah. I didn't I, I I I knew the post people would balk if I told anybody I was gonna do it, so I just went ahead and did it. And oh, really? I think, I think it worked really well. Um so, so and, and and again it was it was it was one of those scenes where you, you're you're building the elements, and the last shot we did, and this is something that director David Nutter likes to do, and and it's really smart. We did the same thing when we did the Red Wedding episode, and we shot more or less in order. And it, as we were shooting it, it kind of it didn't it didn't really feel complete. It didn't really um, feel like we had it until we did the last shot, what played as the last shot of Stannis watching. And then turning away, and we racked focus to his face, strong in the foreground, and you just had this 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 fire out of focus in the background, burning uh, as the little girl's screams finally stopped. And um, you know, between between that actor's amazing amazing acting and and I think that shot, uh, it it when we when, once once we had that in the can, we knew, yeah, we've got a scene here. But you know, it was it was. It, I have to say, the crew on that show are are uncommonly attached to the characters and the scene, and they're 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 very very engaged with the show. And everybody found shooting that really upsetting and disturbing and and unpleasant. And you know, just n- not even putting ourselves into the audience's seat, but just just having to do it. It was it was it was very unpleasant. Um, but I think we, I think we did it in a tasteful enough way that it was, it was, you know, it, it, it achieved its its purpose. Was this one of those scenes you had mentioned when we were talking about loot train battle uh, about the uh, smoke being used to block sun? You know, looking, knowing that that's a technique you use, and looking at the scene now back, it, was this one of those moments where that was done? As a matter of fact, it was um, because yeah. we were we were getting patches of sun there, and um, I, we, I had I had. Uh, I had massive. Uh, I had three or four cranes with uh, huge uh, wind machines on them, blowing both smoke and and snow over the whole scene. Yeah, yeah. And we really had to crank them. And and this is one of the great things I, I love about this crew is that they have. Uh, we've got these foggers. We use the same ones there as we did in Spain. The, I think our, our Navy, U.S. Navy surplus. Um, and they're mounted to pickup trucks that follow, basically can drive around and follow the wind and lay down a really substantial smoke screen. And that was critical there because had you turned around and looked the other way on that scene, you would have seen, you would, I'm not kidding. I've got a still photo I took with my, my iPhone. You would have seen beautiful bucolic green fields of Ireland with a rainbow in the distance. I mean, it was no ridiculous. way. So it, it really wouldn't have suited that mood and tone of that scene very well. Oh, that's, I love stuff like that. Do you have a, did you say you had a picture of that or you wish you had a picture of that? I, I, I do have one, but I, I, maybe, yeah, maybe I could, uh, dredge well, it up for you. If, if it's able to be shared, I would love to do that and put it in the show notes. I'm sure people would, or you can direct uh, me to where it is and I can send people there, but I think that that would be an interesting thing to see. I think I might be able to dig that up because, and, and I'm, I'd be, you know, I, I take, uh, photographs of every lighting setup that we do just quick snaps on my iphone to uh, as future reference you know if you have to come back or if somebody has to if they want to do a pickup or 
you know, we don't, we never do second unit. We actually shoot all our own stuff on Game of Thrones. But in the event that you do, you've got something to show them. But in, in, if it showed sets or actors, I'm, I'm not allowed to. But I think, I think I can, I think I can show you that picture to see what we were looking at um, in the, uh, in the, <laughs> if you, if you face, turn around and face the other way. I want to quickly talk about Jon Snow's death scene. Um, again, another relatively small scene, but so much of it lives in just that last shot. And uh, there's no way that was easy to do. I, there had to be a lot of complication with that, and I'd love to get the inside scoop on it. You're right about that. That the Jon Snow's death was a really tough scene to do. Again, um, emotionally, nobody nobody had any. I think we all had our suspicions that because the red which was in the house that he was going to be brought back to life, but nobody knew for sure. And, and it's always, you know, upsetting when you're getting to start with, when you're getting rid of a, a well-loved cast member, or even if you think you are. Um, and in that case, that last shot, I mean, the, the scene leading up to it obviously had to be well executed, but that last shot was really critical. And just from a purely technical standpoint, when you're photographing a guy in very, very dark clothing, in his case, black clothing against white, um, you don't want the snow to be overexposed, but you want texture in, in his clothing and you want to be able to see the blood coming out. Um, from a lighting standpoint, it was quite honestly, it was one of the harder shots that I did that entire season. And then on top of that, you're working with very little light, so you don't have a lot of stop on the lens, so you don't have a lot of depth of field. And we were doing that that long. We had a techno crane doing a long push straight down onto him, and um, it it took it took an unusual number of takes for us to get that. It took me an unusual amount of time to light it properly and even then um i think visual effects had to go in and 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 touch his eyes up a little bit to to just take the life out of them mm. at the end it was a very hard scene to 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 do both technically and and emotionally what are you shooting the show on uh we shoot on alexa and um throughout they have- all, all the season well all all the seasons have been shot on alexa okay. they they shot the pilot on film um and then the pilot was a disaster by all accounts and they went back and recast and basically brought in another director and basically remade it this time after extensive tests with the Alexa. And wow. I couldn't, I couldn't be happier with that choice. I mean, I own an Alexa, I own cook S4 primes, which is what they also use. Um, so it was, it was, it, that, that was one issue that I didn't have when I first landed there the first time, which was pretty daunting um, when I when I landed there in, in 2012 to do season three. Um, at least the equipment was um, very familiar to me, and, and, you know, I consider that stuff all, you know, my best friend. <laughs> yeah. A lot of the cinematographers that come on and, and DPs, they just are loving that Alexa. They just are. I mean, the Netflix guys, for, for the most part, they're shooting Reds. Um, Actually, you know, I think every all the Netflix shows are on Reds right now. They they have to because yeah. Netflix insists on uh, on 4K, um, which I think is ridiculous because they don't. Most people aren't looking at it that way, and I also don't think it looks that good, quite frankly. Hmm. Why not? It's too sharp. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's just, it's just, and it's it's. <laughs> You know, I, I'm, I'm just, I mean, we, we actually carry a couple of reds on, on Game of Thrones to, uh, you know, that we'll use, for instance, when they need extra resolution for plates for the VisFX department. Yeah, yeah. We'll shoot them on that. But most of the shows done on Alexa, it just, uh, to, to my eye, and, I, I've, you know, I had this conversation once with Roger Deakins, and <laughs> neither one of us are tech geeks. We just like what we see. Yeah. And we don't know how it gets there, but it feels the most like film to me, and Certainly, when I got to, uh, I, um, I was filming a series in Vancouver when when the first one landed there at the local rental house, and they sent it out for us to test. And I actually ordered one the very next day. I mean, it really uh, after after being Mister, I'm never, I'm never going to go digital. Blah blah blah. Like a lot of guys, um, I was sold. I, I I just love it. And the other very important thing to note is that the cameras on that show get the living crap kicked out of them and Alexa's just they're they're Aries, so they always work. Yeah. You never they never have to reboot. You never have to wait for them ever. They're fantastic. Yeah. 
You are listening to the PremiumBeat.com Song of the Week. It's called So Ready by Young Presidents. Premium Beat is the place to go for all of your royalty-free music and sound effects. Their site is so simple, so fast, so intuitive. Uh, You can get access to their collections of thousands of royalty-free tracks for as low as $49 each. And it's not just the track, you get cut downs, 30 seconds, 15 seconds, 10 seconds. You get loop sets so you can customize your track to fit your project perfectly. But the most important thing is the music is fantastic. You're going to love it. Your clients are going to love it. And the world will be a happier place. So head over there, premiumbeat.com. And lastly, let's talk about Kessler. The Kessler Shutter Dolly is the latest innovation in camera dollies and finally provides filmmakers the performance and versatility dollies in its class have always lacked until now. The Shutter Dolly utilizes standard speed rails and can be operated manually or in conjunction with Kessler's motion control solutions, CineDrive and Second Shooter Plus. For more information, visit KesslerCrane.com, KesslerCrane.com. All right, let's move on to the uh, rest of our interview. So much more to talk about with Robert McLaughlin. Let's spend a couple minutes on Red Wedding before we wrap up this conversation about Game of Thrones. And if, sure. you, if you have a few minutes to spare, I'd love to talk about Ray Donovan just for a few minutes. Yeah, um, absolutely. Okay, excellent. Red Wedding, up until uh, the loot train battle, the scene that I've always been told was the scene of the series was the Red Wedding. <laughs> Um, and again, I'm not super fanboy. I definitely have seen that episode. Um, but you know, when you're, when you're looking at this, especially from someone like me that hadn't even watched anything prior to that, um, when that had come out, it really is just one of those scenes that gets, it gets stuck in your head. It's absolutely beautiful. The candlelight, the whole scene, the way that the entire thing is, um, uh, balanced between like how it begins and how it ends. It's just such a great scene. And I'd love to get your perspective on it. I'm sure you talked about it a million times, but not with us. And I'd love, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, especially now so many years away from it. Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, yeah, well, you know, that, that was the first season that I worked on the show and going in and my first episode was going to be the one that Dave Benioff and Dan Weiss had been most looking forward to, apparently, because they knew it was just going to absolutely rock the worlds in a really bad way yeah. of, all the, of, of all the fans. And so the pressure on David Which, Nutter by the way, did, HBO loves to do it. They love killing everybody. <laughs> they, they love to th- build up these characters so you they become your friends, and then they kill them all. <laughs> exactly just, right. Can't, you can't get too attached with any HBO show. <laughs> no, it's 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 best not to. <laughs> Definitely. Um, but you know that also also what um, compels us to 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 turn it tune in Absolutely. religiously every week as well. Um, but yeah, go, going into the red wedding, the the pressure to really nail it was was enormous, and I didn't I didn't really appreciate it until we were you know over there and into prep and um, the 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 good thing about what happened with the schedule there was it was the last scene that we filmed in Belfast prior to leaving to go to Morocco to do the finale of the season, the Misa episode. Mm. And um, so we had quite a bit of time to chew on it. I had, I had access to the set well in advance. Um, We had all the cast come in and we did a rough blocking and a a rough rehearsal. So uh, also well in advance. So I had lots of time to think about it and, and, the big thing for me was how to le- I, w- I wanted to visually subtly lead the viewers astray. I really, really wanted them to think that they were going to get the happy ending because, you know, if, if everything went well for Rob and Walter Frey uh, uh, forgave him and, and um, things went according to plan, um, he was in really good shape to, uh, to, to carry on and, and, and win all his battles and everybody all the viewers really, really wanted that to happen. They loved that character. They loved the Cat Stark character. Um, so I had this idea that it, it, you know, Game of Thrones at the best of times is a very moody show in any set, even a day interior. There's lots of dark shadows where who knows what could be lurking. Um, yeah. And, and um, 
I wanted that banquet scene to feel like, certainly when we first landed in it, that that everybody was going to get the happy ending they wanted. Um, so there, there are three main scene components to what lead, led up to that scene. There's the one when Rob first arrives at the castle and cap in hand and has to apologize to Walder Frey and his daughters for not marrying one of them like he promised to. And I wanted the viewer to feel like that things could kind of go either way at this point and not be too sure about what the outcome of this episode and this, this storyline was going to be. So I lit it the same sort of grim, dismal way that the last time you saw that set was, which was on season two. And then the subsequent scene during the actual wedding ceremony, um, there was an excuse to still have a little bit of evening light outside the windows and um, introduce some warmer candlelight and some softer light. And we, we warmed it up and there were a few smiles shared. And, and I think, you know, maybe the viewer is going to come out of this feeling like maybe things will be okay. And I really wanted them to think everything was going to be great. And it was going to be an awesome, happy ending for once on game of Thrones by having, when we find ourselves in the banquet hall and the wedding banquet itself. So throughout the scene, it starts relatively bright. I mean, it's certainly candlelight, but the place is completely filled. Um, but tell me about how you used the scene and the action in the scene to actually change how much light was in it. Uh, without really giving too much away. Yeah, I wanted the, the room to feel like, you know, as close to a, a happy Disney medieval drama as you could get with, you know, certainly by Game of Thrones standards. Um, but I didn't want it to be so bright when all the shit happens and yeah. when, 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 when the killing starts. So I convinced the director and the producers to overload it with candles initially. And in fact, that scene was about 80% lit with real candle and, and firelight because I wanted it to, to, you know, feel as authentic as possible. We had very little movie lights in there other than maybe just a little something to help clean up a face on a, on a close-up on the ladies. Wow. And what I, I, I got them to agree to having all the extras pick up as many of those candlesticks and torches as they could carry and march off with this this happy parade down the hall to take the bride and groom to their bedding chamber and in that way organically remove the light and the happy mood out of the room so that the viewer wouldn't really be conscious that they were you know that the, the, the mood and the tone were shifting arbitrarily yeah. and only only once they were all out did we end up in this in this place where bad stuff could and did happen. And, and, and I was really gratified with it because, you know, the audience went down all the harder, I think, because there was no, there were no visual cues that, um, anything bad was going to happen. And when you do scenes like this in season three, knowing there's going to be many more seasons to go, you start almost giving away, I, I, it must get harder and harder to hide that something bad is going to happen. I think you almost lead your audience into this idea that nothing good will ever happen <laughs> and, and don't ever expect it. it. Does it become more difficult as scenes go on to keep that a secret as you're shooting? I think that after the Red Wedding, I mean, <laughs> the Red Wedding kicked the, the fans in the nuts so, so hard. I don't, <laughs> yeah. think, I, don't think, I don't think there's anything we could do in future that would... That would that would make them um, drop their guard again. So um, I, I haven't. Uh, I, I certainly, in, in my own case, I haven't um, um, sort of had an opportunity to build any kind of visual miscues into it the way that we did in that, in that instance. Mm. Mm. Let's uh, change gears for a couple minutes here and talk about Ray Donovan, a, a show that I really, really love. Now, this is a show I've seen every episode of. And uh, I'm excited to uh, certainly watch the one that's out now and uh, talk more about what's coming in the future because you guys are experiencing a, a very large change in your next season. Uh, let's talk about that. Yeah, I mean, the whole storyline this season, which which focuses much more on the family than it has in the past. And, and one of the great things about that is that it's really given our fabulous cast um, – Right, right from top to bottom, a chance to really show their acting chops. And you know, there's not a there's not a bad actor on the show, and and some really, I, I mean, they're all amazing. And um, it's one of the things I love about the show, just having you know having a front row seat to the caliber of acting that you get with a Liev Schreiber and a John Voight, a Paula Malcolmson, and Eddie Marsan, and, and and you know, and and the rest. Um, and that's one of our favorite. You know, the whole crew, um, it's one of our 
the things we love most about coming to work on the show. I also love it because I'm given basically 100% free reign to photograph it however I feel is the right way to photograph it. And there's um, been very little um, um, input uh, as far as that's concerned. So it's, 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 you know, it's technically a very satisfying and artistically a very satisfying show to work on. I think there's always a cliche, this, this idea that, you know, the, the location's also a character. Um, you hear that a lot. It certainly makes sense and it means a lot, but there's something different about this show because when you talk about California, you think about sunlight. You think about um, using the sun as a lead to basically everything that you're lighting in your environments. And it's especially true in the uh, Donovan's Fight Club and how the sun is really a, a major character there and, and it lights up that space really beautifully. Uh, when that changes in the next season, well, before you even get there, let's talk about kind of how you use that California sunlight to give the show its look. <sighs> Yeah, the California sun, you know, it, it just, it, it's, it's, um, we use the sun and reflections and, um, 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 multi, you know, they're, they're, we, we, we try and build as much, as many facets into our shots as we can whenever we can. Um, partly, you know, as a, as a nod to, to sort of the, you know, uh, California Hollywood narcissism and whatnot, but, but the hard sun, um, Almost, it, I, I, I want to use it almost as a way to to make Ray feel even more a fish out of water because mm. here he is, he's the South Boston thug, traveling in these glamorous circles, and and he's not from a sunny climate. It's almost like the sun is, you know, subtly um, affecting his character in a lot of ways. But I mean, the other, uh, the, the other obvious thing about it is because, you know, we, we, we've adopted sort of a modern LA noir look and we, we you know, we, we, we've in, indulged that quite a bit and, and, and it's really fun to work with, but it also, it also gives you a good reason to have, you know, classic noir Venetian blind shadows and, and, and it gives you a really pretty hard, um, contrasty source to mix with the with you know our other otherwise very moody lighting so it's 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 really about contrast and and i mean frankly if you've got an excuse to push some hard light through a window in a scene um it's it's pretty hard to go wrong and end up with a with an unattractive looking scene if you sculpt it properly that's going to be something we won't have next season because next season the whole show is moving um entirely to New York, where uh, Ray will be setting up shop to work with his new boss, um, played by Susan Sarandon. Ray is a fish out of water with the California look. Are you going to take a different approach and make him feel more comfortable in more of the gray uh, sort of East Coast look? Um, yeah, I think we're definitely going to be taking a different a different visual tack, and and we might start using the camera slightly differently than we have been up until now. Which is which is you know we don't. We don't move it unnecessarily a lot. Um, we keep it on the dolly or on a good solid platform. Um, there's not a lot of handheld and or, or you know certainly no deliberate shaky cam or anything because basically we we hate anything that draws attention to the camera or that there's that there's a crew there. I'd rather people just rather the photography was invisible to the viewer, really. Um, but yeah. when we get to New York, there might be some practical considerations. I've got a feeling we'll be moving the camera more. I think it will we'll be on the steady cam or maybe on a Maxima rig, which is a another fantastic rig that um, I we we had really good luck with on on Game of Thrones last year. Um, but I've got the nice thing we we literally just wrapped um, season five in New York last week, and now I've got a few months to really chew on it. Um, it's a little early for me to really say what I think it's going to end up looking like. It's it's obviously going to come out of um, discussions with the showrunner Dave Hollander, um, which we're going to start this week. So we've got lots of time to chew on it. But um, it is exciting because you know when I've, I've been doing the show now since season two, and um, it, to get to have a really good excuse to just freshen the look and the style of the show up um, this far into it is really great. And it's kind of exciting. And, and it's certainly going to give me a, a, you know, a new lease on, on uh, the life of shooting Ray Donovan. When you shoot Ray Donovan, are you doing the entire series, the entire season? 
Um, this season, I did the entire season. Last season, I did all but one episode, which uh, was because I was also directing an episode and I needed to prep it. So Roy Wagner, ASC, came in and, and, and did that one and, uh, and bits of a couple of others. But typically, yeah, I do, I do every episode, which, um, you know, a lot of guys hate it because they, they say it's too exhausting and it, and it burns them out. Um, but I've got a really incredible crew who go on the tech scouts and keep me really well apprised of what we're doing. And they are so amazingly good that, um, you know, I, I don't have to worry about being covered from a technical standpoint. It would be helpful if I got a little more face time with directors beforehand. But um, uh, at the other end of the scale, I also really... I really like being on set all the time, and I like having the the pride of ownership in in all the images for the entire season. Um, the, the only t- other time I've really alternated, um, apart from Game of Thrones, which is a, a rule unto itself, is is Westworld, and um, it, it, you know it just um, alternating has its pros and cons. But but really, I'd rather I'd rather just do it all myself. Quite frankly, yeah. Where can people go online to learn more about you? Gosh, um, not on my website because it's drastically out of date. Um, um, it's in fact, it's not even supposed to be up anymore. Um, I don't know. I, I mean, I've, I've, that, I, I quite like that GQ article that the fellow did uh, recently. I think that's excellent. Um, that was well done. Um, you know, there's been a fair bit of stuff out there. <laughs> I don't know. If you're good on Google, I, you can probably find more of me babbling <laughs> here or there. See, this is the sign of a very accomplished uh, director of photography. They're, they're the ones that are always like, I don't know. I don't even look at my site. It stinks. <laughs> <laughs> and it's it, it's all of us that are trying to get to that level that are like, here's my Instagram. Here's my Twitter. Here's my this and that. I yeah, love well, I've, 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 I've had, a, I've had a, a, very, a very high class problem the last few years. I mean, I'm, I'm just... Um, this week is actually my first full week off since June of 2012 when I got back from scouting Game of Thrones. And oh, my God. I've had because, because Game of Thrones has dovetailed so perfectly with the Ray Donovan schedule. And, and you know, I took I did I skipped season six of Game of Thrones to do Westworld, which also dovetailed with the Ray Donovan schedule. Um, so literally I've been on set or, you know, sh- shooting or working 50 weeks of the year since for five years now. So I'm just kind of happy to <laughs> maybe, maybe finally I'll have some time to catch, get my website caught up, but I've been, I've been too damn busy to do that. So don't that's spend your thing. first week off making your website. Ugh, that's, that's not a good use of your time. <laughs> no, I probably won't. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for uh, sharing this time with us. Really appreciate it. Uh, you're a great guest. You do fantastic work and we'd love to have you back next time. You have something new to talk about. Thank you. It's my pleasure. I'd love to. There he goes, Robert McLaughlin. Thank you so much for being on the show and uh, helping us really finish what we should have done a long time ago, which is cover the Game of Thrones. <laughs> you know, Everyone talks about the show and we should have had him on earlier, but he's there now and all is well in the world. I want to thank Matt Russell from Gain Structure Sound. For mixing and mastering and make the show making the show sound so good. You can find him online at gainstructure.com and on Twitter at gainstructure. And while you're there on Twitter harassing Matt, you can harass us. We like it. At Go Creative Show, at Go Creative Show. Let us know what you think of the show. If you have any guest suggestions, we'd love to hear them. A lot of our guests come directly from our Twitter friends telling us who to put on the show. So we rely heavily on that. I want to thank our sponsors, Hedge for Mac, Rule Boston Camera, Kessler Crane, Newshooter.com, and PremiumBeat.com. Without these people, the show wouldn't exist, and that would suck. So support those that support us, and we'll keep cranking out episodes week after week. See you next time.